Well, the title of uh, today's message is Resurrected for All. Now, if we, if we go back, if we go back some 2,000 years, and we're in Jerusalem, and we consider what has happened over the last seven, eight days, what just happened? What happened in this week, 2,000 plus years ago? So let's walk through some of the events. Jesus was anointed for his burial, and that was with a very expensive perfume. Now, that was worth over a year's wages. So in today's uh, money, twenty-five dollars to $40,000 worth of perfume. He was anointed very well. <clears throat> he, uh, Jesus raised his good friend Lazarus from the dead. And uh, this miracle was well known throughout, throughout uh, uh, Jerusalem. You know, this was not done in a corner. You know, when somebody is, 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 has been dead and is raised to life, that gets attention. See it on the six o'clock news, breaking news, right? Um, and it, that miracle indicated that Jesus was Messiah, Son of God. He was triumphantly escorted into Jerusalem to the temple, accompanied by shouts of, Hosanna to the Son of David, and blessed is the King of Israel. Now, certainly this riled the, uh, the Jewish leadership. They wouldn't have been happy about this. And then Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers in the temple, and he said, my father's house is a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. He was, he was placing himself in authority with this over the temple. My father's house. You have made it a den of thieves. And he instituted the Lord's Supper, and that he institute, instituted as a memorial of his sacrifice. Uh, he be, uh, and, and Judas betrayed, Judas, one of his 12 closest associates, betrayed him with a kiss, betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Jesus was tried, he was rejected, he was scorned, and he was crucified. The crowds yelled, crucify him, crucify him. The Jewish leaders said, we have no king but Caesar, the very Messiah, the very Messiah, Savior, King, who was sent to the Jews, were rejected by the Jewish religious and political leadership. And Jesus said, out of his love, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And there was darkness from noon to three as Jesus hung on the cross. Now, did you think that people noticed that? I would say, yeah, right? Again, this was not done in a corner. In moments before he died, Jesus said, it is finished. My work is finished. My salvation work is finished. And then there was a mighty earthquake. And that mighty earthquake shook the temple. There was destruction in the temple by some, by some uh, reports. And uh, the curtain of the temple, this curtain may have been as thick as nine inches. And it was ripped from top to bottom. And I think it was like 40, 45 feet high. I forget exactly. But this was a major rip in a major curtain. I mean, our little shears are not very thick. <laughs> Nine inch curtain, that's a thick curtain. What else happened? Dead people walked out of their tombs. Rocks were split open by the earthquake. These were extraordinary days. It wasn't done in a corner, it affected everyone in Jerusalem in some way. So let's, let's, let's ask the question, what, what do you think occupied people's thoughts and feelings in Jerusalem at this time? What do you think they were thinking about? The end of the world. Huh? The they probably thought, yeah, this could be the end of the world. Fear. fear. Absolutely, there was fear. Wonder, right? What's all this mean? How do we put this together? How do we understand it? You know, and, and, and remember, this was the time when the Jews were coming to Jerusalem for Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the, they, were, they were planning to be there for eight days. 
Uh, you know, we're, you think some of them might have been concerned about lodging? You know? Uh, Jerusalem was filled to overflowing. This was, this was uh, a major time of, of people coming to, to Jerusalem. Uh, maybe heightened expectations? It, could this be the Messiah? What, why, are the, why are the leaders, why are the leaders killing the one who we thought was Messiah? I think it was a time of both fear and wonder. What were, what were Jesus' disciples thinking and feeling? What do you think? Fear and discouragement. Fear and discouragement. What else? What did the disciples do when, when Jesus was, uh, was uh, apprehended uh, by the uh, temple guard? They ran, they ran away. They fled. Now, we don't want to be hurt. We don't want to be involved. What do you think they were thinking now after Jesus was, was crucified? He might have been remembering what he told them. They might have started remembering what Jesus told them. Do you think they were feeling some remorse? What about Judas? Was he feeling remorse? What did he do? He, he killed himself. He went and killed himself, yeah. They were distraught. They thought it was all over. Peter said, I'm going fishing. And six others went with him. And what were the Jewish religious leaders thinking, feeling? Thought they won. Yeah. So glad all, there, there wasn't the rebellion after all. We thought there would be a, a Messiah creating a, 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 some sort of rebellion and lots of people would follow and there'd be a huge uprising, a revolution. We, we got away with this one. Probably thinking something like that. Um, what were the Roman leaders thinking? Oh, that's what we're answering. I'm sorry. Uh, oh no, the Roman leaders. What are they think? What are they thinking and feeling? Maybe so glad we kept a lid on us on this. So glad, so glad it didn't explode. Because if it exploded, the Roman leaders there in Jerusalem would have been in big trouble with Rome. They were supposed to keep the peace. So what did the chief priests, Pharisees, and Pilate do to secure the tomb? Do you remember? They put guards out, they rolled a rock. What else did they do? They put a seal, a Roman seal, the seal of Pilate, the governor, on the stone. And if that was broken, it was their heads. It was important. And what do you think Satan was thinking? Victory, I won, right? But he is risen. He is risen indeed. Now this, this is a tomb, this is not the tomb that Jesus was, was entombed in. This was the Herod family tomb. I've been in that tomb. But it shows, it shows what the tomb was like and what this rock was like. This is no small pebble. This thing weighs as much as a car. And it was, it, was, it was in a slot, and it rolled down a slight incline to, to close it. So it was much easier to close than it was to open. It was, it was heavy. It was not an easy thing. But he is risen. It was empty. The tomb was empty. So how do we know that Jesus really did rise from the dead? How do we know that? How do you know that? I'm sorry? He showed himself. He showed himself. Yeah. To whom did he show himself? I'm sorry? 500 at one time. Well, we read that, uh, that scripture earlier, right? All of those accounts that, that Wilma read dealt with it. And do you remember doubting Thomas? What, he didn't believe. He was, one, he was one of the 12, he didn't believe. He didn't believe. Unless I put my finger in the, the holes where the nails were and my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
Jesus showed up. Thomas put his finger in Jesus' wounds and in his side. And what did he say? My Lord and my God. So, here are some other scriptures that talk about that. Uh, This is in Luke 24, verses 36 to 39. Jesus himself stood among his disciples and said to them, look at my hands and my feet, because they had holes in them. Touch me and see, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So this is a resurrected human body. This is Jesus' resurrected human body. And notice that it says flesh and bones. Yeah, when we talk about a body, we talk about flesh and blood. But he couldn't say that because his blood had been spilled. His was a resurrected body of flesh and bone. In Acts 2, verses 31 to 32, now this is Peter uh, some 40 days later at, uh, well, more than that, 50 days later at the first Pentecost. And uh, he said of David that David spoke of the resurrection of of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. And this is Peter who was a witness. He said, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. This was not done in a corner. We were all witnesses of it. He was speaking to the, the, the uh, believers, uh, the, the probably mo- mostly Jews in, in Jerusalem, as he was saying, as Peter was saying this. Um, my point, unless Jesus had been raised from the dead, there would have no, been no witness of Christ, and there would have been no church. People do not go for a dead savior. A live savior makes all the difference. Jesus is that alive savior. And so the existence of of the church itself is proof of the resurrection. And what does Jesus' resurrection mean for us? It, It sealed that his death was a true sacrifice. Uh, that he had something to give that was worth all of humanity. He was, after all, our creator. Through him, the Father created all. It means our sins are forgiven. It means there's no condemnation for sins for those who believe. It means adoption as God's children, and it means our own resurrection from the dead. Uh, so, and it means that he was qualified to forgive our sins, that our sins are forgiven, and that we will also be resurrected from the dead. And it sealed that he was able to forgive our sins. I already said that, haven't I? <clears throat> um, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to, 30 to 22, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. This is, this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Now, the man through whom death came is Adam, and uh, the resurrection of the dead came also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now, we believe that we are all sold to sin and sold to death through Adam. And that, that word all is the same, same word. It's the Greek word pos. And it means all. So Jesus is resurrected for all. Again, this is, this is the title of today's message. Jesus said, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Now this is something that Jesus said before his death, talking about, because he knew what God's plan was, and, and he, was, he was working that plan out with the Father. It shows that he's speaking of, about God's plan from him, or for him, excuse me. Um, and here in, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 29, John, and this is speaking of John the Baptist here, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of Norway. Oh, wait a minute. The sin of Tennessee. No, it says the sin of the world, doesn't it? 
And the Samaritans, uh, uh, it, this is uh, when Jesus uh, had been dealing with the Samaritan woman who had a whole bunch of husbands and the one she was living with wasn't her husband. And uh, afterwards, uh, she had talked to the people in her town and then Jesus has stayed with the people in the town. And then the, the Samaritan said to the woman at the well, we no longer believe just because, because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Another scripture here in Romans, this is Paul writing to the Romans, he's consistent. For if by the trespass of the one man, that's Adam he's speaking of, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. Notice the word all. We've got to deal with this word all. And, and this is just the last part of what we read earlier. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. We can't ignore these scriptures. We cannot, cannot ignore this word all. We have to think it together with all the other scriptures uh, to have a right biblical understanding of salvation and of the good news itself. So, point Jesus' salvation for all of us was finished on the cross and ratified by his resurrection. So how does that work? Our salvation is nothing that we can do for ourselves. We can't save ourselves. There's nothing we can do. Uh, we can walk down 300 um, sawdust aisles. That doesn't save us. It's a gift it's a gift that the Father through Jesus gave us. And so that we have nothing to boast about. It's all of God, it's all of Jesus. And, and, and Paul makes this clear in the book of Romans. Uh, he says to the Ephesians, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. There's belief involved. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So even the faith is a gift of God, not by works. Nothing we can do gets us saved. It is the gift of God to us, not by works so that no one can boast. Uh, so what does this mean? We begin with Jesus who, with the Father as the word created humanity and said that creation was very good. Again, Jesus, well, it was through Jesus that the Father created humanity. And when, he, and when Jesus created humanity, it was very good. The Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, love humanity. They love us, always have. You know, when we make something, we love our creations, especially if they're really good ones. <laughs> you, know, you know, maybe the, uh, the doghouse I made with, um, as a kid, uh, maybe not. <laughs> if I had built a, uh, something, a, a garage, I'm not a builder, but if I had done so, uh, as an adult, I, I could be very pleased with it. We like to see our creations. Uh, and God is love and he loves all of his children. So what does this mean? Again, salvation is a done deal for Jew and Gentile, for slave, for free, for male, female, black, brown, white, red, yellow, whatever else. And by done deal, I mean that from God's standpoint, it is a done deal for everyone. From his standpoint, whatever, he has done everything necessary is what I'm trying to say. Uh, he's done everything necessary for our salvation. We do need to believe that that's the case to enter into that salvation. In faith, we need to live out that salvation. God has not taken away our free will to reject it. We can reject it. It's there. It's done by God for us. Um, Jesus died and he rose for all. Um, Jesus died for atheists, for Christians, for Muslims, for Hindus, for Buddhists, and all others. Remember, 
Jesus died and rose for, ever, for all those who reject him. It says, even while we were enemies, he died for us. Even those who, who are in sin, he died for those. He has died for his enemies. Remember, he says, pray for your enemies. Jesus loves his enemies. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And in 2 Corinthians 5, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and excuse me, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, not counting men's sins against them. We are forgiven. So, there's no more favoritism. Jesus is Lord of all. Let me say it again. There's no more favoritism. Jesus is Lord of all. We have this in Acts verses 10, verse, uh, chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation, from every nation, all peoples again, the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Now, question. What would it be like if we truly believed that Jesus died for everyone, rose for everyone, and was Lord of all? If we truly believe that to the, the, the greatest depths, what would it be like? How would we look at Jesus? What would we think about Jesus? What would we know about Jesus? Would we, would we know in a deeper way how much he loved mankind? Would we have a, a greater sense of that? And for the future of mankind? What would his lordship mean for us? What would, that, what would his lordship mean? Does that mean that I have to give up being lord of myself? Yeah. Yeah, we aren't lord. He is lord. It means willing submission. Willing, eager submission because we are in agreement with him. We see how wonderful he is, how, how, how great that love he has is for us that it, it, it opens for us doors to eternity with him. And it only gets better and better and better. God is good. So we give up the title Lord for ourselves. How would we see ourselves? Ideally as bringer of good news, as one bought with a price, as, as one who is grateful to God for what he's done for me. And you can say for me, for yourselves, <laughs> for all of us. So, and, and how would we look at others? If, if Jesus is Lord of all, if he accepts everybody, there's no favoritism, then how, do, how should we look at them, at everybody else? Any, any thoughts? As brothers, and sisters. as brothers and sisters. As equals at the foot of the cross, right? And with the same deep, caring, compassionate love that Jesus has for everyone, even if they're his enemy, even if they don't look like us, if they're different, God loves them. So, points. Jesus' death, resurrection, and lordship of all is truly good news. And it shows us the deep, deep love that Jesus has for us and that we should love as Jesus does. 
I'm going to go close this with a, a scripture from Isaiah, Isaiah 12, verses two to six. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. In that day you will say, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, and we've done that very well this morning. Thank you for your selections, by the way, Rick. Uh, Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Great is the Holy One of Israel among you. God is a saving God, and he's done everything needed to save all of us through Jesus. All, everyone is included in his love and his life. This is joyful good news. And this is joyful good news, and it's worthy of sharing. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you so much that you are the God who who loved us so much, loved all of your created humanity so much that you were willing to go through the, the death that you did. And we thank you that in your plan, Father, the, Jesus was uh, risen from the dead and that we have an alive Savior, one who in him is the fullness of life. We ask you, Lord, to help us to live in that same fullness that you live in. Give us the resurrected life. Live that resurrected life in and through us. Help us to love, accept, and, and care for all others as you do, Jesus. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.